Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, um, whichever time zone that you're in right now. Uh, welcome to the Horasis Extraordinary Meeting on the United States of America. Uh, and the topic today is ensuring knowledge is free. My name is Sinartus Sosrajoyo, and I'm an advisor at Damson Capital in Singapore, and I welcome everyone here. Uh, we have here in our panelists today, um, Claire Chen, Managing Partner at SZLTI Source Consulting Group. Welcome, Claire. And Hi. we have also here Jim Yuan, Partner at JoyView Education. Welcome, Hi. Jim. Hi. Right. Uh, we should have another person, but I am hoping that he'll catch up with us soon. That's Renan Godinho, founder of Flirtar. But in the meantime, I think uh, because time is limited, uh, I am going to start the session now. And, and thank you for those who are uh, able to join us. So today's conversation is about education, you know, ensuring knowledge is free. How do we create a more egalitarian, classless society that's able to absorb and apply knowledge? I, I think I'm going to begin with in that, I, you know, we're discussing specifically about the United States of America, where, you know, the big dream in the United States is that anyone can make it. Anyone who is starting at the bottom, you know, could, you know, make it up to the top. <clears throat> and we've seen a lot of exa good examples of that. I mean, great examples of that in the recent years, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I think the disparity uh, that has been uh, recorded, that has been studied by a lot of organizations is quite concerning in America. So, I mean, America, like any other countries, would like to think that education can be a great equalizer. Uh, but the, th the, uh, the issue with the disparity, uh, in terms of what we've seen, there's a quote from the HertzingerReport.org, which is an organization that does educational research uh, in, the, in the United States. In 2015, during the Obama administration, the Federal Education Department issued a report that showed how the funding gap between the rich and the poor grew 44% over a decade between 2001 through 2011. That means that the richest 25% of school districts spent $1,500 more per student on average than the poorest 25% of school districts. So when we look at those numbers and uh, barring, you know, the disparity of the numbers themselves and how they're reported, uh, and, but, you know, it's something of a, of a state of mind that when you say, well, equality is a bit hard to achieve in that sense. So today we have about 30 minutes to discuss this and I would love to be able to hear everyone out. So I'm gonna ask the panelists to keep it to hopefully less than five minutes for answer for question. Uh, we've got a couple of questions already uh, that we have discussed before. And our first question that I would like to throw out to the panel uh, is how does the uneven distribution of resources for education affect people from different communities differently? And we're talking about diversity. Now to open this up, uh, Claire, you uh, be, be so kind as to enlighten us. What do you think about that? Uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, it's very important to having a fair resources of education in the U.S. And the whole um, social society that needs to have a right uh, mindset and uh, have the, you know, set the right attitude as well. And um, there are a few points. Um, I think tech is a line of help for the poor as well. They have a chance to explore the world and make new friends all over the world and learn the knowledge from all of the social medias. So um, from the top down government and to the bottom up the private sectors so like companies, the community and the community center under the umbrella of the institutions, I think that's all very important to we need to think about how we uh, this US can improve this fair resource of the edu education. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to pinpoint something that you mentioned before during our uh, you know pre sessions is in terms mm -hmm. of technology, right? Because you work a lot in technology. And, you know, you, you quoted me some numbers before, which is quite, you know, like mind boggling. I mean, we're talking about the United States of America. This is in our country in the last, you know, last 50 years or so has been in the forefront of technology, you know, like, you know, what we've seen so far in NASA, what NASA has completed in you know, achievements of sending people to Mars, along with other countries involved in it, actually. But, you know, there's NASA, there's uh, other, uh, other achievements, internet. Uh, how are the internet situation in terms of technology in the United States that could enable uh, 
you know, education to be more equal? Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to talk about a problem because uh, I think a few days ago I saw this video from uh, Andrew Young, and he was uh, uh, he, he was uh, doing an interview, and uh, he wanted to run to uh, a mayor of the, uh, the mayor of the New York. And uh, I was very surprised about because of COVID nineteen since last year, and then uh, there's a lot of kids actually staying home and then have to learn things from internet. And according to his uh, interview, and I was surprised with the number that nearly eighty percent of the New Yorker in the house they don't have internet access for all the for the student and kids. Right. And how can you, uh, you know, if you want to learn something through, yeah. through the technology, this is a very, uh, it's a lot of improvement. It's very surprised right. me about this news. So, yeah. so that's yeah. the, the, the issue I see. And uh, in terms of technology, let's say the SpaceX actually operates uh, a constellation of uh, approximately of 13, uh, 1,325 stop links. Okay, the broadband satellites, and by end of this year, uh, they're gonna have twelve thousand uh, satellites. So mm -hmm. that means, uh, which is it can uh, in most of the location over the next several months, and they can cover a lot of places around the whole Earth, and people can have access to internet. So once if you can access the internet, um, people can easily reach the free education online. Right. One of the right. Another thing for the main kinds, actually for um, you know life saving, if somewhere in the ocean or somewhere in the jungle, you know mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. can actually sure. easy to to uh, you know detect and then find. Okay. To, to okay. Pretty much. So. Great. Great. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And uh, for those of us, who, uh, those who are just joining us, uh, the topic right now is you know how do we. Uh, how does the uneven distribution of resources for education affect people from different communities uh, differently in the United States? Uh, Jim, would you like to chime in on that? Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, senators, and thanks, Claire, for sharing. I want to build a little bit on what Claire mentioned in terms of the disparities, but also, uh, in, to some extent, try to also take it uh, in a global context, uh, because the, the, some of the issues that are apparent in the U.S., uh, it's uh, not U.S. specific, and one can see similar disparities in other parts of the world as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having I grew up in the U.S., I went to primary school, uh, middle school, high school, um, college, and graduate school all in the U.S. And uh, you know, I, I myself had a lot of student debt that I, I had to uh, to repay. And I was personally, you know, from personal experience, uh, a part of the uh, American public school system. So uh, I remember um, just from a personal story, going up, um, and this was in Miami, Florida, I went to a public school and we, we had uh, just students beating each other up. And it was, it was considered cool to, uh, to do that and stuff to study. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, and, and then you know, my, my, my family uh, at the time, this was many, many, many years ago, moved to a, a, a more affluent uh, uh, neighborhood for uh, during my high school years. And it, it was almost night and day in terms of the, it suddenly became cool to for people to study and and to actually be good students, and mm -hmm. uh, and part of that is that uh, you know it's uh, there is a, I guess in a way you can almost mathematically plot out the um, uh, it as a function uh, in in some extent of location and also income, right. and and the and the location income are in a way also functions that are are in in, in some ways uh, interdependent as well. And uh, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, oftentimes, especially for the public uh, public school system, um, depending on where you are, the funding, the public funding, can mm -hmm. be very very different. You know, how much yeah, real estate yeah, tax yeah. you pay can have a big uh, big difference. Exactly. But it's exactly. Not, um, mm -hmm. Arguably, it's not uh, unique to the U.S. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. if I want to give a, a, a example also from um, mainland China as well, where in China you have the system called the hukou, where depending on what your hukou is. That's uh, oftentimes where your kids go to school, and uh, you know, in, in Beijing you have um, these amazing um, schools, the high school affiliated with Indian University, Beijing Number Four uh, High School, etc., that oftentimes have more resources than um, than a typical college, 
Mm-hmm. And but you need to have the Huko system uh, to be a part yeah. of the system to have the Huko to be able to be eligible for right. Right. for these schools. And and right. you know, income disparity also um, it's a problem in other parts of the world. I, in Philippines, where I am right now, um, it's a it's a huge problem in terms of the income disparity um, mm-hmm. and the and the um, impact multiplied by COVID, the negative uh, impact of COVID on um, communities here in terms of access to education yeah. as well. I think in parts of <laughs> other parts of the world, like India and Brazil, um, mm-hmm. there may be also similarities <clears throat> in that regard. Right, right, Jim. Uh, I mean, great, uh, great insights. And I, I think yeah, in comparing to other countries around the world, it, it, the United States is not alone as well. <clears throat> there, you know, income, <clears throat> excuse me, income disparity is there. Um, but you know, as someone that just chimed in, I believe uh, from Amir, you know, he he wrote his zip codes, and I think in a you know for those in the United States who know that you know for those who are trying to live in certain areas, a lot of young families with young kids or those who are planning to have children, they look at zip codes, you know, to an intent where like we need to have good ed- you know public school education, uh, so we got to find a zip code that is really really well funded. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, but again, you know, not many people, you know, have that luxury, right? You know, for those who are the have nots, you know, they're, they're stuck in a place where they don't have that. And, you know, what uh, I like to come back to what Claire was saying regarding the technology, regarding how the access of internet, even in New York City, you know, if those numbers are correct, you know, uh, by Andrew Young, about 80%, that's just, you know, insane, right? So, but at, at the same time, you know, we're, we're talking about now the acceleration of technology due to COVID, you know, for education. Uh, we're, you know, what, what are your thoughts in terms of how can, is there sort of a line between how technology can progress, you know, the, the, uh, the disparity? I mean, I'll give you one example since we were comparing some things to China, you know, and this is not to say that it is good or bad. Uh, but, you know, there was a report that I've seen uh, recently where China has gone all out in technology down to the fact that, you know, children are wearing some kind of headgear to see whether the kids are focusing or not when they're at school. And, you know, I mean, they also have, you know, things like location based to, you know, to track the children, whether they would leave, you know, the school grounds or not, and et cetera. And I don't see that any yet in the United States, and I'm not, and I'm hoping personally that that won't be the case because that you know in, in a way that is a bit crossing over the line in my opinion. But you know I would like to kind of ask back to the panel, maybe starting with you, Jim, uh, in terms of what technological steps right now are needed apart from internet, you know that could level out uh, you know the disparity. I think uh, to answer your question, I'd like to uh, bring forth the concept of online communities in okay. terms of um, from, a, from an educational perspective, it's not uh, only what knowledge we, we get, but also the community of learning that we get. And especially following COVID uh, in terms of the, ha- the changes in habits and the changes in, in the, on the education front, the ability to for uh, folks around the world, also across the United States, to um, level the playing field by fostering, developing, and participating in more and more educational online communities. And, and just a, a personal example um, of mine, I, I, uh, I, I sometimes, uh, you know, I, I join these um, online networking events that were hosted by Singularity University, and uh, it's, you know, it, they, they're a uh, burgeoning, opening um, online community of learners who, from mm-hmm. all uh, over the world, uh, across all different ages. And I remember once when I, I was in this event and uh, I had an encounter with a 10 year old uh, student, a, a girl from India, and she was on there. And it was amazing having that conversation. It was so inspiring to have that conversation. And for, for someone you know, across the world, um, across the globe in India, um, to be able to learn and speak with uh, different entrepreneurs and innovators on a, uh, a different topics regarding bio. She was really interested in biology. We we're talking about biology and mm-hmm. uh, really having these uh, interactive uh, learning online opportunities that don't require tuition, that don't require mm-hmm. physical uh, being in a physical space or a physical zip code. But at the same time, mm-hmm. all you, again, all you need is a is a fiber cable to be connected, to speak, to network, and to really actively learn from each other. Okay. Okay. And uh, 
I want to move on now because I mean, if you have that kind of uh, uh, that kind of incentives, you know, in order to be able to 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 reach out world uh, nationwide and even worldwide, you've got to have the support, uh, I think, from the government. Uh, for example, like in I'm located now in, in Indonesia. Uh, it's not perfect, uh, but at the same time, when you compare the Indonesian access to internet, uh, the availability of how cheap the internet plants are here, it's actually wonderful. You know, you you're able to get you know people down to the mass mass you know uh, the lower the half knots. They're able to you know pay internet per day wise, and then they can get actually be online if they have you know the other equipment uh, needed like laptops or smartphones or whatever. So I think part of that is the you know perhaps it was a marketing ploy for the government to be able to you know push out internet you know uh, nationwide. But how? You know how important is this role in you know, the government's role in the U.S. and what kind of the what kind of issues that you see so far, uh, perhaps within the U.S. government's uh, uh, role that may be either permitting this or hindering this. Uh, Claire, I'd like to pass this on to you. Oh, um, I think this question wanna Jean to answer. What do you think? Oh, okay. Uh, like I, 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 uh, I don't want to delve into U.S. politics. There, there are many panels uh, about that. Uh, they're very interesting. That I certainly also learn a lot and very informative. I think um, in regard to U.S., there is um, again a push to really have the private sector take the lead on some of this, and the government. Uh, I think arguably on both parties have incentive to incentivize uh, the private sector, you know, especially tech, mm -hmm. to really uh, take up the mantle and really innovate more of these um, opportunities, opportunities per se. So, so and it, it, part of that is because of how the, from a framework perspective, how the U.S. government works and its, you know, um, its, its constitutional frameworks and all of that. Again, I, I don't want to delve too much into mm -hmm. that uh, compared to yeah. certain uh, certain other governments that I, I don't mm -hmm. want to name either, that may have other um, incentives in in terms of frameworks. And not, again, not saying which one is right, which one's wrong. Yeah, right. uh, and I, I do also want to uh, go, I guess, go back to Indonesia. Um, I do, senators agree that um, you know I, I spent a little bit of time in in Indonesia uh, and many years ago as a digital nomad, and uh, <laughs> the the feeling has been that it, there's a significant improvement in the infrastructure. Internet infrastructure, right. learning infrastructure, as well. Um, it's getting getting better and better. So you know, kudos, right. good job on your governments uh, to work on that front. How about this? No, um, in terms of U.S. government, like I said in the beginning, I think fair resources of education in U.S. is very important. We need to look at it from the top down and the bottom up. The top down from the government mm -hmm. and the bottom up to the private sector's community has to all work together and. Maybe this also uh, some of the university need to come by um, some good solutions. Which is have have program for a, a student to do uh, co working with the Fortune five hundred company together, and besides mm -hmm. all the uh, scholarships, just uh, tuitions, and but it's still not enough. So you know, for poor people, okay. it can be actually uh, a, a, a result their their need. You know. No. So, now you you've opened up the Pandora's box, Claire, in terms of tuition and fees. Now, but this is going to be the fun part. Uh, but I mean, again, I mean, we are talking about you know education disparity, right? And I think one of you mentioned there during our previous calls is you know I believe it was Jim, right? Uh, or was it Claire? Uh, regarding what is what is the debt amount right now? The total debt of you know the education debt for you know people with student loans in in the United States at this point. So we're looking at uh, statistically around six, 36 million uh, borrowers totaling about uh, 1.5 trillion uh, in student loan debt. So wow. it's, a, it's a big number. Yeah, that's, that's a huge number. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, we, we, when we talk about this and when I looked at, you know, some of, you know, people who are, you know, when Amir, uh, one of our audience is talking about zip codes, uh, anyone now that who is local uh, to the zip code and who wants to go to a really a well-named school uh, in the United States that is within their district, 
that does not give them a, a, a free pass either. Like a lot of the locals would have to pay anywhere from, I believe, $7,000 to $14,000, depending on uh, the kind of plans for that state school. And, you know, when, when you're talking about a number of $1.5 trillion in, in debt, you know, if, you know, uh, you know how how do you fix that? You know, like how, how you know how do you how do you because I know the and Claire was just mentioning also right. You've got a friend who's who's in the medical school and you know close to half a million dollars in debt, and she, you know the person is not even a doctor yet. I mean, how 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 can one justify that? And how do you fix that? medical school? Yeah, or right. it it it's a it's just tourism is very expensive for people who study uh, medical. In, in yeah, Europe. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot. It's a lot of uh, the schools so, are quality and they all and, pretty much end up there after they uh, working and making actual fortune. They when they turn fifty something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I did uh, hear about a uh, believe a couple of years ago in an NPR uh, a news uh, segment that they were trying to do a different business model uh, in terms of student loans. I believe there was. Uh, uh, they were taking some cues from, I believe it was Brazil or another country, where mm -hmm. the student loans, uh, the payments of student loans, would be pegged upon of how how well they will be able to get their jobs, and how you know what jobs they you know they can get in terms of if they get a higher paying job, then they would be paying uh, slightly more in student loans wise. But if they're not able to get the job, you know, within a certain benchmark of then they wouldn't be paying as much. Well, what, what do you think of that? I, um, can I give some input? Actually, uh, sure. if you intend to take analogy, that, let's talk about the solution and positive way. Right. Um, we are in the modern century, and besides I mentioned the government, no matter which party, <laughs> we yeah. need to work on top down and bottom up from the you know, private right. sector and community uh, institution and university. But technology is really good. Once you have that, you know, um, let's say this one startup company just uh, recently raised the Series A fund round. It's called School Links, and then mm -hmm. which is provide all the you know uh, the help, the, the, a better platform for kids and parents through the kids' strengths and you know path and career. So not just only uh, you can learn, and then now. The, a lot of university, including all the Ivy League school, they have a free courses online, and uh, even including, for example, some people want to learn how to code. The code 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 org, and it's a, it's a free program. And there's course a lot of free program as well. Um, uh, there's also uh, if people who want to learn the artificial intelligence for uh, machine learning, that Stanford University, Columbia, Google. Google actually have recently uh, come out with a new program. Besides, uh, Jim mentioned about the uh, Sudorality University. And I think the Founder mm -hmm. Institute is doing a really good job. But why? They mm -hmm. have a program to, you know, a free training course for entrepreneurship and to, you know, how to do a business. And that does mm -hmm. all, all, a lot of good resources there. But how can we um, see, uh, you know, they can, Turn into more uh, like a more mass for you know all the students. Right. Well, right. The first thing you need to resolve the internet problem, like not you your internet problem. Right. Right. <laughs> but, it, but I think that that as you said, if the corporates can help as well, that'll be great. Uh, yeah. But since we're talking about corporates, uh, there's also another uh, story which I've you know uh, learned about, and this came from Germany. And this has to do with uh, tax avoidance for a lot of these corporates, a lot of these big corporates. Yeah, I mean, we're not uh, we're not talking about tax evasion here. We're talking about tax avoidance, which Legal is quite, ways. Legal yeah, ways. yeah. But the tax avoidance uh, law, which you know allows companies to essentially report taxes elsewhere, which then trickles down to the lack of then lack of funding for what these tax taxes were supposed to fund the districts. And there was a, a town in somewhere in Germany that was having this issue now. Uh, a lot of their bis the big businesses are using this, you know, tax avoidance laws. And, mm -hmm. you know, it has trickled down to the point where a lot of the schools are really lagging in terms of being able to fund themselves, you know, in able to uh, do renovations and, you know, the technological improvement. Well, well you know, I think that's also a line where, you know, if we want to pitch that the private sector should help, 
you know, uh, perhaps there's something else within, you know, the tax laws that, you know, the government, again, as you said, Claire, this guy has to be from top down as well, right? The government has to kind of look at this. And, uh, and do, you, do you think that's a fair statement to say that, you know, the, the corporates as, you know, as much Um, I think it can be uh, either sponsorship from the corporate. The other way mm -hmm. it can be uh, the the sponsorship from the um, or the philanthropy and, mm -hmm. and for a profit. And these days, uh, a lot of programs actually. Um, um, if you're not just only you can just know it along line, they. Um, um, they can work together with the, uh, you know, what, what's the trend those uh, students? Okay, I would say, mm -hmm. for example, i just give you a sample. Google recently, they have program for people to uh, uh, learning how to do their code of this and that. They're going to training the, the, the maybe computer information system like that. So uh, even giving a certification. So that means they also even guarantee they can get into all the dot-com company, um, mm -hmm. company they can work for instead which is they, they, they spend uh, maybe some free course and maybe some like less than $300 for six months or more of the courses you finish, you get receive a certification. And it, it beats four years of uh, university. Some people go right. to four years of university, undergraduate, they don't, even, they don't even get a good job. But for yeah. this, you have the certification, you get a good job, you get good pay right. to besides Google, anywhere. Mm -hmm. really, Take a knowledge company, you can go. So yeah. that's the right. that's the thing that you can not just only help education for free and also help in the career. Okay. You should not buy together. So. Right. Excellent. Okay. And Jim, uh, do you have any thoughts to this? A couple points. Uh, yeah. On the financial front, there are uh, currently companies going along what you had mentioned, uh, Senator, is also what uh, what Claire had said. There are companies that in the U.S try to reduce student debt and loans. For example, PwC, Price Auto Coopers, they have a student loan repayment program. Um, mm -hmm. Fidelity Investments also has that. A lot of tech companies like Hulu have piloted programs that help students uh, reduce their debt and, and loans. So that, that is certainly one area of alleviation. Um, but that's uh, oftentimes tied, there are some strings attached tied to yeah. the corporates. I've had a discussion um, with um, Professor Marklin, who is a a uh, harasses participant speaker at a previous education panel where we talked about uh, how um, corporates in the, in the private sector, so building on what Claire said uh, as well, corporate sector can step in at the earlier stage. So not just what Fidelity Investment mm -hmm. PwC is doing post-graduation, but ahead of time, pre ahead of time, it's almost like a bargain where, hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to support your uh, education for the next four years, but then you come work for us for a number of years. It's kind of like how I think for many MBA programs they do it. You know, whether yeah, it's yeah. Bain, McKinsey, BCG, right? They you have this almost like devil's bargain where mm -hmm. you have to work for a couple of years post graduation for them, right. and then you can reimburse your education, and that works right. to a certain extent uh, in terms of alleviating the cost. But I want to bring a, um, a, a a counter alternative uh, uh, way hypothesis of potentially looking at it from a um, from the other way around. We, we, we've certainly been talking a lot about free education or lower cost education. So if we can bring the cost down, right, yeah. with more internet proliferation, more online communities, more online education, mm -hmm. Coursera, edX, uh, uh, what a lot of the, 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 the uh, companies and the tech that Claire had mentioned, if we can bring the overall cost down. It doesn't seem to make sense for the yeah. tuition to, continue to be that high. If the cost is going to be lower, yeah. it's going to be lower, uh, right. we can still pay for the professors, the teachers, and, and, and the overall infrastructure. <laughs> There's probably less physical stuff to have to pay, so the, so the financial projections are much cleaner. So maybe the overall tuition would be lowered from mm -hmm. that end to right. allow more equitable education. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Claire. Um, I cover some of Jim says that uh, on top of that, for rich people to the middle class of people in U.S., uh, it's easy to assist the high education, even even to the uh, top Ivy League school. 
this type of school. But it's really hard for poor people uh, to get the free education or luck of the uh, free education. So I actually um, I think um, it's important for um, it's a, it's a recommendation. <laughs> No offense to all Ivy League universities. <laughs> For higher education, I think that it's just a suggestion to open more equal opportunity okay. for yeah. for everyone around the world, not just you know. Right. And, and I think the they have to look at it, and revisit the the criteria for the entry requirement, admission, uh, sorry, admission assistance, and look at the. Uh, mm -hmm. The financials of the co-working, uh, uh, all of four high four, uh, five hundred company, you know, uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right. for for living costs besides you know, scholarship, and they know uh, where to find a good resource to work with this company and solve the problem. Actually, can help the student. Not so. So yeah. if they can uh, revisit those criteria to you know. Um, a little bit, you know, entry requirement, and then I think the um, the equal opportunity can be right. there. So right. this is very well, important. So <laughs> that's very true. That's very true, Claire. Now, I, I mean, I want to have uh, name millions of dollars or for building or whatever right. for for one yeah. university name, they can get into the the good yeah. school too if they don't have a good school. Yeah. So sure. I think fair resource of education and, and in terms of equal opportunity, I think uh, okay. yeah, we need to revisit. Okay. That's it. That's uh, the thing yeah. I like to cover. Okay. Now I, I wanna be I wanna give a disclosure to our audience, right? I mean, because in, in a way we're talking the macro things. You know, we, we don't know the inner workings of schools, right? Like, for example, if we were to ask, why does it cost so much money, you know, to go to school in the United States? And I think, you know, we there's a lot of other factors into that we, we can't discuss in 40 minutes time. You know, right. there's a factors of, you know, the cost of the teachers, maintaining the teachers, you know, and how do teachers get, you know, their certifications and et cetera. And, you know, whether the government, you know, should play a role in helping, you know, teachers. I mean, I, ever since homeschooling, you know, I've, I've basically enrolled myself in second grade again, you know, in a way with my youngest daughter. And I have the utmost respect for teachers. I mean, you know, especially now online when they can't have that physical face-to-face, -face, you know, presence. And what a great, what great teachers can really make a difference in, you know, and at least in my children's life. So, but, you know, we're, again, we're talking about things that are macro here and we, you know, it's impossible to go into the details, but I just want to and I'll have a last uh, thought about this. Maybe, in, you know, we would let, we have about seven minutes left. You know, yeah. I would like to open up to uh, any Q and A's. Uh, anyone uh, who wants to chime in, please go ahead. And I'm, I'm monitoring the uh, comments and question box. But yeah, I mean, in, in terms of that, like, why is it so expensive? Do you guys know? You know, why? Why do you know? Like, I mean, some of the schools of fees, the increased rates of fees from like when I was going to school, you know, like when I graduated in the late '90s to now. It's just like, oh my gosh, am I able going to? You know, am I going to be able to send my kids to school? Even I'm asking that yeah, question. Yeah, the same question too. Absolutely, <laughs> I think it troubles me tremendously in terms of the the, the rise in the cost of uh, of overall education. And this is again, yeah. it's not just the United States, but globally in many other parts of the world as well. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and and just a, a, a minor a minor point uh, to your point, Senator is. Uh, in terms of, and sometimes you know, as a parent, I, I question the the value of it as well. In terms mm -hmm. of, you know, we, we've done tremendously well in terms of uh, lowering uh, overall over the past decades in terms of lowering illiteracy and increasing school enrollment across the globe. But is education really preparing our children and children's children for a future that is very much uncertain and potentially technologically and geopolitically volatile in the future as well? Is it? Yeah. Um, if, uh, if, imagine if you were born in the year 1900, um, what is, what education system in nine, the year 1900 would have prepared that person for the turmoil that would have happened throughout the 20th century? Right. And, uh, and, and there's that, uh, discussion. I, I, I learned, uh, from the, uh, one of the plenaries, um, Megan Smith, one of the speakers at the plenary, she mentioned something about the five, uh, what she mentioned, the five C's, comprehension, computational thinking, critical thinking, creativity, and civics, and how um, education, in terms of the education system, you know, we've done very well in terms of the fundamentals, but um, 
but many many parts of the you know, in, in this uh, not just the U.S. but many parts of the world, uh, we may have not done as well in terms of fostering mm -hmm. more critical and computational thinking. And I think the UA, OECD did a study yeah. that less than twenty percent of right. American youth can actually determine and distinguish mm -hmm. facts from opinion. So, yeah. uh, as a parent, I'd like the you know if I'm going to be paying a lot of money, I like mm -hmm. that you know, tuition to really. Um, make a big difference in terms of the critical thinking, right. the essential abilities of my yes. child or many other children in the future generations to be able to uh, be better prepared for whatever comes next in our right. very Excellent. fragile yeah. world. Yeah. Excellent point, Jim. I mean, critical thinking is one thing, and I think that is in line with what here. We've got a comment from Jen uh, Van Dusen, a Sustainable Development Director. Uh, great question from Jen. Uh, as we get more online courses of all kinds, should there be more common understanding of what qualities as education, for example, certification standards, and et cetera? And I, I think that's in line with what you were just saying, right, uh, in terms of, you know, who are teaching these courses? You know, like I mean, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you one example. In you know, in Indonesia, when you have this this booming of uh, they call it sort of like the hybrid schools. You know, the ones who are teaching English and the ones who are teaching you know uh, uh, Bahasa Indonesia at the same time. And you know, at times I'm wondering, you know, whenever I meet some teachers, it's like, what qualifications do you have to teach? You know, I mean, you can be a great person, but you know, well, what are your certifications? And as you said, Jim, right? I mean, if we as parents putting in money into this, we would like our kids to be challenged, to be able to, you know, to have critical thinking. And as we know now, you know, I think critical thinking and common sense is pretty lacking you know, in our society at times when, you know, especially when we hear a lot of the comments or, you know, uh, stories that, you know, is going around. And sorry, go ahead, Claire. Um, yeah, we got three that's minutes. why the education system uh, slowly, slightly different. Uh, for example, Elon Musk, he created a school called Tulastar. Um, you know, kind of like an Astra, Astra or something. It's Tulastar, like innovation school um, for all the kids from K-12 to, uh, uh, you know, to high school all together. And then depends on their um, their talents. And, and and maybe you go to math class or, or chemistry class, you meet a five-year-old or 10-year-old, 15 years old together, or you go to the painting class. This is a, it's, it's an innovation, and, and they put the best uh, uh, together. I think this system is quite good. It's it's different like uh, our traditional educations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, but again, yeah, I think in – Whichever uh, corporates would like, like Elon Musk, you know, to to uh, to provide these kind of venues. Uh, I think it goes back to we do need a standardization in certifications. Uh, I think comparing coming back to you know what United States versus perhaps other uh, developed countries. I was at all when I have you know I I have this friend who's an exchange student a long time ago that went to my college and he wanted to be a teacher. Like that's his dream, that's his goal. He's from Germany, and I'm like, really? Like I don't hear a lot, you know, about Americans wanting to be teachers. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, the pay is wonderful and everything. And as I spoke to him about this, and I learned that it's not that easy becoming a teacher in Germany. It's it's you know, there's a specialization, and I think it's not only Germany. I think a lot of other uh, countries do this as well. They really prepare the teachers specifically, you know, psychologically. You know, they have to be able to handle psychological issues and et cetera. But then it you know, it's uh, it's a different perspective than those. You know, I think what I've seen personally so far in America, you know, those who want to be teachers. And again, I I feel for them. I, I you know, like a lot of the stories of qualified teachers perhaps, right? You know, that they have to have two jobs, three jobs in order to make ends meet. You know, that really breaks my heart, you know, especially now that I have my own children and I know that good teachers really make a difference. And that's it. Okay, well, we have about a minute left. I mean, if anyone else wants to say something, closing time, um, Claire, would you like to start with you? Maybe you need 30 seconds. Review, stick with the technology. As long as you internet and you find the great resources online and uh, stick with the Starlink, <laughs> they have satellites, and you can as easily everyone can uh, access this uh, free internet. I mean, it's not free; probably ninety dollars per per person per, 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 per month. Right. Yeah, but still very okay. good. Yeah. 
Okay, Jim? I, I, I want to build on your excellent point, Senator, in terms of the teachers. And, uh, you know, and there are many countries around the world, the United States as well, that have been concerned regarding how to raise the standardized testing, overall standardized testing scores, mm -hmm. because it's a metric. I, I get it. It's a, it's a metric in terms of measuring academic and uh, educational accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So there has been a push in the U U.S. recent in the recent years to um, basically uh, to uh, put the promotions and the, uh, the 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 criteria of teachers in line with the standardized testing improvements. Mm -hmm. Which is good right. in theory. It's good, but it, what it causes is. A, a large number of public school teachers that are basically become